Welcome to the Corlin Economics Report, a weekly look at financial and political topics relating to asset-based investing. Guests on this program pay no fees to appear, and guests and hosts disclose any equity interest in companies profiled. Now, the Corlin Economics Report. Hey, everyone. Welcome in to the weekend edition of the KE Report. Corey and Chad here, your host for this weekend's edition. Also, your host throughout the week on our website, kereport.com, and podcast, The KE Report. On this weekend show, we're going to focus a lot more on the resource sector. I know it was a busy week with a lot of central bank meetings, including the Fed, and we covered those throughout the week on daily editorials. So again, if you want to comment on those, if you want to see what our guests had to say about all the central bank meetings and market reactions, go back and listen to the daily editorials. This weekend show, as I said, focused more on uh, resource investing, especially driving down into the stocks. We are starting the show off with Joe Mazumdar, editor of Exploration Insights. Now, Joey, saw you at the recent conferences in Vancouver. There was the Metals Investor Forum, also the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, and the AME Conference, all back to back to back in Vancouver. First and foremost, Joe, your takeaway from the conferences, what did you think this year? Well, thank you uh, for inviting me for the first one of uh, the year. So uh, for me, uh, the the uh, the conferences in Vancouver started with me conducting a capital markets for uh, geologists, geoscientists, as a precursor to the AME conference. Uh, and that happened on the Thursday, Friday prior to the conference. Uh, that gets me good insight into um, the next generation of up and coming uh, geologists, geoscientists that might end up being, you know, CEOs of the next round of junior companies or beyond. And that course is basically telling, teaching them about the capital market. So how do they raise money? How does the company that they're looking at, if they're looking at M&A, raise money? How do they impact, how do they get impacted by the markets? Um, you know, uh, you know, how do people look at buys and sells? What is the sell side? What is the buy side? All of that. We've been doing this uh, short course for about five years now, I think. It's a really good venue for for people to learn about the capital markets because we talk about the capital markets because that, that, that's what we do. But but there's a lot of people that work in the industry that don't understand still who are technical, how the capital markets work, uh, how do the companies they work for raise money. And so that's what that course is about. Uh, uh, and then and then I went straight to the Metals Investment Forum. Uh, and, and I thought that was very well attended in terms of uh, people and attendees. And and then we had the VRIC over the weekend. And definitely what stood out to me was the lack of gray hair. We were just commenting. And so I, I the way I do it is that if it's if it's hard to find Brent in the audience, then I know that's probably not a good thing. Uh, and this year it wasn't hard to find him. The n- number of companies might be less, but but that's a trend that's been continuing from last year due to people's budgets. Because the financing risk for these companies really hasn't changed. Uh, that much. And then going into the AME roundup, some people were telling me you know, there was a lot of contractors and uh, consultants and that venue part took a lot of the actual stands at the AME. But uh, again, most of the conferences were well, well, well attended from, from the time that I was there. Well, Joe, just being at all those conferences and kickoffs at all, th- all three of those events, or four if you count the one before the Metals Investor Forum, were there any commodities that were standing out as getting a lot of traction uh, or any that were standing out that were just kind of dead in the water? Which ones do you think were getting the traction with investors in the discussions you had? Well, a lot of people asking about uranium. I mean, obviously, that was the, one of the best uh, performing commodities last year, up over 80 percent. But interestingly, the uranium equities weren't they didn't do as well. So they're not showing any leverage. And so the idea is like, well, where's the split here between the two? I mean, we saw the same thing in gold for different reasons. And uh, more people are into the uranium ETFs uh, like the Sprott one and other ones to get direct exposure to uranium without taking a chance on a producer that might, you know, might not generate a big margin or a developer that might need multi-billion dollars to start up their project 
or an explorer that may or may not hit uranium uh, intersection. Uh, they're going straight to the commodity. And that's probably, as an investor, if you're first time into this market and you're thinking, well, you know, this sector is really undercapitalized. You know, hey, I read what these guys at COP28 want to do with, you know, with nuclear power. They want to triple it. You know, there doesn't seem to be enough of it. The price is shooting up, you know, and then we have this market segmentation that and then Kazakhstan is putting out that their production is going to be they're going to have a shortfall of production because of sulfuric acid. And I don't know if it was labor availability or whatever. And then the other problem is this foreign ownership interest that if Russians or the Chinese control more than 25 percent of an asset, then that asset you know can't be sold. Uh, the product can't be sold into the U.S. That could impact Kazakhstan production. I don't know. But all that is making uranium very interesting. But, you know, the first level of ex, uh, of invest would probably be the commodity if you can get it without doing a deep dive on individual companies and that. And I think that's what we're seeing. Then people would have to get in, uh, you know, comfortable with the companies because if you're really bullish on uranium, you know, you probably are not investing in that Kazakh producer because they're producing less of it. And Cameco has actually gone more downstream than, you know, they are increasing their production out of uh, Cigar Lake and some of their other operations in Athabasca Basin. But, you know, it's not a big growth profile by any means. So, you know, that that exposure is, is going to be interesting. And, and I think probably rightfully so, they sought it first with the commodity. In all fairness, though, Joe, we, we have seen a number of uranium companies do quite well. It's really been, I think, the one of the only standouts for a lot of investors in the space that always hold a wide range of commodities. What about something like copper, though? Because copper, we keep on hearing about this bullish case for copper, and copper continues to be a number of people's number one pick for the year, the same as last year, though, hasn't really seemed to get running in terms of the copper price, nor have the stocks gotten running. What did you hear on the copper front? What do you think about copper? So I am one of those. I fall into that bucket of people that were bullish on copper last year and continue to be bullish. The The issue about copper is on the demand side and the, you know, the probability of a global um, a slowdown with all the, you know, the geopolitical crises might have a, a negative impact on uh, global growth. And most of the predictions of the GDP is supposed to go down in 2024 versus 2023. So less GDP growth, less industrial production means potentially less demand for industrial metals like copper. So copper in the near term, you know, is not doing well. But importantly, it's setting us up because the incentive price isn't there for people to build. The incentive price isn't there for people to expand and reinvest. And so the supply surpluses, I mean, sort of the balance surpluses that people had, uh, you know, forecasted for 2024 are now turning into late 2024 deficits. And why is that is because we're not seeing that production come up. You know, we've seen Cadelco basically revert to production profiles that we haven't seen in a couple of decades when they were ramping up. Uh, we saw Cobra Panama, one to one and a half percent of total global production being taken off the market. We we're seeing other people having problems starting projects, whether it's resolution in Arizona, you know, the Pebble Project in Alaska, you know, and, and forcing people like Barrick to go to Pakistan to uh, to uh, develop projects. You know, uh, QB2 is being built, but the overruns on capital there have basically scared probably other producers uh, into expanding their own projects. And so all that production that we thought was going to come online isn't coming online. But we still are, you know, uh, making this carbon neutral world that requires electrification, that requires copper. So that intensity of demand is still out there. But then where is that uh, copper going to come from? Because uh, at least we can put our finger on the fact that, you know, if we don't start doing something now, it's not going to be there. Uh, and that's what continues to make me bullish about copper. And so copper is one commodity I'm willing to go from exploration, development, and production on to get leverage to it. Well, Joe, just one takeaway. I'd like to float this idea by you from these conferences and really just over the last year or two is that in something like copper, 
the producers have actually done pretty well. If you look at the Copex, made up of mostly copper producers over a three to five year period, it's actually held up pretty well, held on to most of the gains. A lot of those companies, some of them are near 52 week highs still. And same thing with uranium. It was the producers that really ran more than the explorers. Same thing in gold. Even over the last year or two, it's been a tough sector, but we saw a lot of double digit and even triple digit gains in some of the mid tiers and smaller gold and silver producers. But we're not seeing that trickle down into the developers and explorers. Is it just a market where the producers are getting the love and will eventually see that catch up in developers and explorers, but have investors been better served to avoid expiration stocks? So in terms of uh, uh, like whenever a, a commodity goes up, the first leverage provided and the liquidity, you know, that's provided also by these the, these companies, their producers, uh, is the first one to go. Uh, so that's exactly where you would see most of uh, it. Because, I mean, if you're Alamos or whatever, uh, intermediate producer, major producer, you know, uh, you don't care really, maybe because of your share price. Uh, you don't care if the central banks are buying gold as long as the gold price is going up. Because the bottom line is that your revenue is going to go up. If you produce the same amount, you're getting paid 15, 20%. You know, that's a positive. That's not the case for a developer. You're not getting paid anything. You know, uh, is the finance environment any better? That's your primary concern. And the problem is the, pri- your, the financing environment for gold projects is, is still not good for development projects. And it's not good for explorers. More people are interested in critical minerals. And critical minerals have more access to capital from governments, private equity, and, and some other forms. I, I think some, I hate to call it the smart money, but some people have seen this in the precious metals and are looking at that as a window of opportunity in terms of some precious metals developers uh, and some developers as a as a sector to saying that not only is our sector undervalued, but this is a certain component in our sector that is highly undervalued because there is no there's no access to capital for the equity component that's required to develop this project. It doesn't exist. Even if they can get 70, 75 percent from the debt markets and a stream, let's say, or whatever, they can't ever get that other 25 percent. It doesn't exist out there. So that for me, uh, you know, uh, potentially, you know, generates an opportunity for those who are contrarians right now. And the best of those projects, I think, will find that contrarian funding. You know, uh, but in terms of copper, uh, what we'll see and we have seen is M&A for production, just like we've seen in gold. The question is, do we see that M&A now spill over into development? And I don't know if the incentive price right now is there because you buy this project and then you have to build it. And uh, we have seen that probably the copper price right now is not high enough to incentivize these people to build projects. And so they're holding off on acquiring development projects right now. And so the development project that I hold in copper, I'm convinced right or wrong that they could build it themselves and they have actually access to capital to build it themselves. Yeah, that's been so critical, that access to capital. We hear all these companies say how they're going to fund builds and it's taking into account three, four different sources of funding. And unfortunately, they don't seem to be coming together. Just circling back around two precious metal stocks then, because look, the mid-tiers have done pretty well, or at least the select mid-tiers have done well. The majors continue to struggle. The juniors, there's almost a non-existent interest in these stocks. You mentioned how that can be a contrarian play, but look, we've also heard that These stocks were cheap last year. Even two years ago, they were cheap compared to where the gold or, or, well, yeah, mostly the gold price was. What finally gets them moving if we're not even seeing the majors move? A sentiment will be important. And sentiment was changing the latter part of last year because I think we discussed this before that, you know, uh, a lot of people were convinced and, and me as well that real rates had peaked. So if real rates had peaked, then that's positive for gold. But then the trend has to be down. The the gold price, the, the real rates have to trend down, and that will help gold price sentiment. The problem is over the last couple of weeks, uh, not knowing if the Fed was going to cut. And then, you know, the, at the beginning of the year or the end of last year, people were predicting, you know, up to six cuts in interest rates in 2024. 
you know, the number of those cuts and the amount, the absolute amount of those cuts has reduced because, because uh, the U.S. economy isn't doing that bad. So if the U.S. economy is doing good or okay, which it is, it's over 3% growth year on year, and, and the inflation as measured by, let's say, core personal consumption expenditures, PCE, is, you know, two to two and a half percent around the Fed target, then there's no reason to cut rates or no reason to cut them anytime soon, you know. And so if that's the sentiment, then real rates won't nosedive. And if real rates don't nosedive, then people will take their foot off the accelerator with respect to gold. Well, Joe, just maybe one more thing it would be nice to share with our audiences. You have a background working with majors, evaluating the up and coming projects. And while we don't have time to take a deep dive into it, you're you're working on some proprietary models that you'll share with your subscribers. But just in a general sense, what are some of the key criteria that you would look at when you're trying to evaluate, let's say, an up and coming advanced explorer with a deposit uh, that may be defined or getting close to defined or a development stage company. What are some of the things that you would help narrow down the field and really make those companies look more attractive in the eyes of a major? Okay. Ignoring, let's say, the capital structure and just looking at, let's say, the uh, the value, the X that we're trying to determine. Like, what could this be? And that's always a question about retail. They don't want to know downside. They just want to know what could this be? You know, uh, because these people are risk lovers, it's a lottery ticket. You know, how big is this this thing can, could, could be? And so what we'd look at is saying, okay, what is the analog for this deposit style in the area that they are in? And what's the probability that they could find something like that? You know, that would be your expiration upside. You know, they could find another one. Theirs could be bigger or theirs could be smaller, something like that. And then once you know the details of the analog, you know, then you could say, well, you know the jurisdiction, you know that a deposit could be built there because there's one right there. And then you would look at the risks to your your thesis that it could be something like that. Then you could look at, you know, is is the metallurgy the same? Do we know that? You know, is it more remote than the other? Is it uh, have a social license to operate issue? something like that. You know, all those things that would would make somebody who might consider buying the project say, you know what, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll buy this one. And so that's something you want to know. I mean, the stock could still go up and you could still do really well, but what you don't want to do is keep holding it and ride it down the other side. You want to know, well, I knew this was going to be a problem, so that's why I sold. I might not have sold at the peak, but I knew that, you know, I'd made a nice return, and now this other stuff could be coming out soon. And that's going to be a problem for this company. So that's the sort of stuff we want to put together in this rate and rank tool that I, me and this uh, friend of mine who now is a prof to my alumni at Colorado School of Mines, uh, that I put together for Newmont back in the 2000s. I hadn't dusted that thing off since that time. And I, I did that capital markets course and on, on my day two presentation, was about this management tool in terms of how we how to look at assets uh, uh, and, and on from a risk and reward perspective. How do you go about comparing assets too, then, Joe? Because this portfolio management tool, everyone always has that question, right? Do I sell this to buy this? Yeah, and the thing is that what the whole idea was to put in these various categories of reward, whether it be you know what's the resource, what's the potential, you know, valuation and PV wise, what could be the IRR, what could be, uh, you know, the life of mine ounces on this, and a whole bunch of different factors that at that time in the 2000s with Newmont, we aligned with the key performance indicators for executives. So they were doing exactly what they were paid to do in terms of when they made a capital decision. So you could, t sorry, take that tool and apply it to your own things that you're looking for. If you emphasize resource upside, that would be the category that you weigh the most on. If you are very concerned about geopolitical risk, that would be a category you weigh very highly. And then you could look at that and say, well, you know, I have this other deposit that's not worth as much as this one in terms of upside, but on the risk side, it's a lot easier because I don't have X, Y, Z in terms of problems. 
You know, one thing I've also looked at is, you know, uh, uh, how much it costs to drill. So, you know, I'm just noting that now in Nevada and in a lot of places in the Great Basin in the States, now, now it's costing, you know, up to $600 in places uh, per meter per core to drill, which is quite high. In taking you back to when GT Gold was drilling Saddle North several years ago, four or five years ago, they were paying about $380 to $400 per meter Canadian. Now we're at $500 to $600 U.S., drilling in a place that you have road access and you don't need a helicopter. So those costs have gone up. And then take that and say, well, what does it cost in Alaska? What does it cost in the Yukon? What does it cost in all these remote areas? Because if money is hard to get, bang for buck, I'm going to get less drilling. And that's a concern to me. Like to say, okay, well, they can't drill it as much as I want. So when we could drill it less, the less chance of getting a decent intersection where they can come back to the capital markets and raise more money, hopefully at a higher price than what I came in at. So that's another thing I'm watching. Okay. Well, there's a lot to watch in this market right now, right, Joe? Because unfortunately, well, outside of uranium and uranium stocks, there hasn't really been much moving. So I think everyone's trying to weigh their portfolio and say, is this better than something else that they have in their portfolio? And what is the upside outside of just simply better sentiment, which could lift all stocks? So, hey, it's a tough market out there still, but some positive takeaways from the recent investment conferences, especially being the fact that uh, it sounds like there were some younger people on the floor, just even through that data. We'll see if that carries over to any market action. Joe, thank you very much for your time. If you want to follow along with Joe, you need to go visit the Exploration Insights website and check out that new portfolio management tool when Joe releases it. could really help you manage your portfolio. Joe, again, thank you very much for joining us this weekend. Hope you have a great rest of your weekend. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Al Corlin's firm, A.B. Corlin and Associates Incorporated, provides consulting services to public companies on matters of regulatory compliance. To find out more, follow the link from www.kereport.com. The Corlin Economics Report will be back after this brief timeout. All right, welcome back. Continuing to listen to the weekend edition of the KE Report. And as promised in the back half of this first hour, we are continuing to focus on the resource sector as we are now chatting with Matt Geiger, managing partner at MJG Capital. Matt, we have a few more big picture topics to get to here in terms of what investors should be looking for when investing in some of these companies and in all fairness, what MJG is going to be doing with some of your capital. First and foremost, I do want to highlight something you sent out to your clients recently. It was a list of management red flags. Now, we always hear about how important management is, invest in management. Usually we hear the positives in terms of that, but I know we have a lot of listeners and we focus sometimes on what are some of the management red flags out there that you need to pay attention to we're not going to be able to get to your whole list because I think it was quite a long list, but we can touch on individual ones. First and foremost, though, Matt, what were you trying to get across here in terms of these management red flags? Good morning, gentlemen, and good to be back on the program here. First call of the uh, the new year between us. I hope it's off to a good start. You're right. I, I did get out the, the most recent uh, MJG partnership investor letter a, a couple weeks back for any listeners that are interested in, in, in reading the whole thing. It's available on the fund's website at mjgcapital.com. And one of the pieces in it that got the most feedback from, from readers was this list management red flags. Uh, so basically what I did is I, through my own experience, as well as canvassing a few trusted investors in my network, accumulated a list of, of 25 different red flags, you know, focusing on some of the more obscure ones that could maybe be of use to, to readers of the letter. So you know, I, ne- I neglected to include, you know, management loading themselves up on, you know, cheap, cheap half cent founder shares or management teams that have faced legal or, or regulatory issues before and focused on some more obscure ones. I would say they largely fell into four different categories. 
And these, these four categories were personal enrichment, distracted or loss of faith, warped incentives, uh, and uh, lifestyle uh, companies as warnings as well. So those were kind of how they, they broke down. And I, I should also just include as a caveat, for any investor in this space, I think one of the best ways to avoid management teams that aren't going to do you well as an investor is to just focus on those teams that have treated you well as an investor or, or trusted members of your network well in previous deals. With that said, sometimes you do come across what looks like a very compelling opportunity with a group of people that you may not know all too well. And so I don't think it's worth discarding that out of hand because you aren't familiar with the principles. But that's you know in particular where this list of red flags can come in handy. Yeah, Matt, it's so true that uh, in general, a leopard does not change its spots. And so if they have a, a spotty history, uh, you maybe want to steer clear. But in that sense, too, if a management team has been good to you and delivered repeatedly and built value in repeated companies, success also leaves clues. But let's dig into a couple of these. I'll start with the lifestyle companies because we hear that all the time. You don't want, you want to avoid lifestyle companies. And if you drill down and ask people what they mean, a lot of people are talking about totally different kinds of companies or totally different things they're looking at. In general, it's people that are enriching themselves by paying themselves a fat salary and not really advancing a project. But how sure. do you look at lifestyle companies and what are the red flags with lifestyle companies? Yeah, well, I think in the letter, there were there were seven or eight different points highlighted for this lifestyle company category. You know, two that, two that come to mind at the moment, and this is a big one, looking at GNA spend and marketing. So GNA and marketing in one bucket relative to the company's market capitalization, uh, as well as the amount of money put into the ground by companies. And really, you want to see companies putting at least 75% of their annual all-in budget into the ground. Um, but unfortunately, in this space, it's often that's often flipped on its head. And teams with overly inflated GNA, that means they're, they're probably paying themselves too well, um, and also traveling very well and, and not being judicious with company capital, and inflated marketing expenses can indicate that they're more focused on raising money so that they can continue to proceed with their their, their chosen lifestyle as, as the CEO and management team, and less focused on actually creating value by putting money into the ground and um, and hopefully driving a project forward. So, that, so that's a real big one that comes to mind that falls into that category. Another one would be management teams that have shown a tendency of what one member of my, my investing network calls ambulance chasing. And the idea of ambulance chasing is you'll see groups that every couple of years will abruptly pivot their focus to pursue whatever the hottest metal is at the moment, you know, the metal du jour. And you'll, you know, so you'll see the groups go from lithium to now uranium, which is most topical. And you know, a year and a half from now, they may be focused on another metal. And if, if you see this, you know, clearly defined track record of ambulance chasing, it becomes clear that the group's less focused on actually creating value and bringing an exploration or development stage project to, to, to the point where it could be built and create real value for, for shareholders, more focused on just being in the hot space so that there's always access to capital and, and money available. So on the lifestyle front, those are, those are two that, that come immediately to mind. Now, let's talk about the personal enrichment warnings then, too, because this can sometimes be tied into lifestyle type companies if, I guess, management is paying themselves too much. But it's a whole bigger picture here. So what on the personal enrichment aspect would have you concerned? That's right. Yeah. I mean, there is some 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 bleeding over between the two categories, I, I will admit. But a few on the, on the personal enrichment front. One of my favorites is to look for whether key members of management personally own a royalty over uh, the company's flagship project. Royalties can be extremely valuable in this business, especially as we've learned over the, over the past 20 years, especially in North America, as the royalty business model has, has kind of has taken over. And for a properly incentivized team, they don't want royalties on their assets. They don't want their assets to be encumbered. The more encumbered an asset, the less likely it is to ultimately be pushed forward and, and become a mine. So if you see a, a member of management who kind of sneakily has a one and a half or two percent NSR over the company's flagship project? That to me is a, is a, is a very is a, is a is a bright red flag. Unless there's some you know absolute extenuating circumstance that could that could potentially justify that. I guess another another quick one would be you know board and management teams that issue themselves options that vest immediately. 
there, there's no reason that should that should occur within 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 this industry. They should be gated and invest over over multiple years to ensure that the teams committed to the cause um, over over the time frames that are necessary to actually create value in this industry. And I, yeah, I guess another one that we'll see somewhat often are key members of management being granted outsized discretionary bonuses for events that are well within the company's give normal course of business. So you're already in a lot of these cases being paid pretty well to be a top dog at one of these companies. And if you do your job well, you should already be well incentivized between the shares you hold and the salary that you're you're receiving. And so there's no reason for there to be, you know, reward heaped on on the top again unless it's it's an incredibly exceptional circumstance. Yeah, Matt, there is no shortage of companies heaping those rewards onto their management teams to keep rewarding themselves for really underperforming and not putting much money in the ground. Uh, There's another one I want to ask you about. We were talking a little bit about it off mic. I don't know which category you'd put it in, but it's the nature of when a company has multiple projects and they decide, you know what, we're going to spend one of these out. And you notice a management team shuffle and then a lot of the focus on the flagship project that they've been touting for years as this is our favorite child suddenly becomes orphaned because they get interested in the new Spinco and then it's a whole new life for them and a whole new lifestyle company. What do you do with Spincos? Because there's good ones and there's bad ones. That's right. No, I mean, this one is more nuanced, um, but I definitely do touch on on Spincos. So I think I think as an investor, you, you need to look at it a couple ways. First, is the Spinco warranted? And, and sometimes it is. Sometimes it's a very valuable project. It's time for it to shine. And it, it, it's not receiving value within within the mother co. So said spin co occurs. Then the question is, should the, the management team of you know the mothership also assume uh, a role at the spin co? Sometimes that can be justified. Sometimes that cannot be justified. But the biggest red flag to me is when there's a spin co out of out of the mothership. Management of the mothership do not take management roles at the spin co, and yet management from the mothership receives founder shares, options, you know, uh, cheap cheap shares in the Spinco, even though they're not going to be participating in its management going forward. So that that regretfully happens more often than not than you than you would expect within within this industry. Um, so so that to me is the, is the brightest red red flag. Sometimes it can be justified for for management to take over control of the Spinco as well. So it, it can get a little bit more nuanced in, in those perspectives. But yeah, we, we do see circumstances where even though there's no involvement from the point of the Spinco going forward, management still pockets a, a bunch of cheap shares you know, for their own benefit. So I, I do throw that into the, the per- personal enrichment category. All right. Well, if you want to find out all of the more obscure red flags that Matt outlined, again, you can go over to the MJG Capital website and uh, get some more information from his letter that he sent out. Let's talk about this year's strategy for the MJG Fund then, especially when it comes to new investments. When we talked to you last year, last year was a lot slower of a year for you in terms of adding positions, in terms of adding new investments, but it did start to pick up at the tail end of the year. What's 2024 look like? And yeah, that's that's exactly right, Corey. Um, we actually went a full eight months uh, without initiating a position uh, between February of 2023 through early October 2023. So that that is actually the longest period without adding a new name within the portfolio that we we've undergone since since the fund's inception. So a lot of patience, a lot of sitting on my hands and and waiting over that period. However, as as we headed you know into mid to late Q4, uh, it really just got bleak out there. While I was waiting for the broader market to roll over, that simply did not occur. But nonetheless, juniors were getting slammed, really, really blown out. And and this is in a period where metal prices hung in there pretty well. Uh, The prices of senior mining equities hung in there pretty well. Um, Of course, the broader market was rip-roaring ahead. So we saw this huge disconnect between the junior space and really most other financial markets. So I did make the decision at that point to, to plug my nose and buy when things were cheap and unloved, even though it felt unpleasant and uncomfortable because we hadn't seen that broader market crash that that I was waiting for that is that is yet to transpire. So basically over the past 90 odd days, we've participated in four different private placements kind of in force and went from what was a double digit cash position to now close to fully deployed. 
So, so very aggressive deployment in a pretty short period of, of time. You know, to your to your question, that means we're going to be a pretty inactive here for the next for the next few months as we kind of rationalize these recent deployments. You know, the MGG fund is open ended, and I'm expecting further inflows in the coming months. So, we will have some some dry powder to deploy this spring, um, but certainly not anticipating doing any further deals or or adding any new positions on the open market between now and at least the uh, the PDAC conference in in early March. So now it's now it's a, we're back to a bit of a period of, of sitting and waiting. Um, I definitely don't anticipate it's going to be another eight month wait though before we add our next name. Um, I will note it's actually looking to be a, a, a good time to deploy into placements just in the past week or two. We've seen a number of companies come out with with pretty positive terms from an investor perspective, not from a company perspective. We're seeing a lot of full warrants, long dated, no accelerators, you know, being tacked onto onto financing. So especially if this continues, I could see us doing another deal or two, but but most likely in the spring to, to late spring period. So Matt, one more quick question regarding the position of the MJG fund and how you said you're almost fully deployed. I'm sure a lot of investors in the space also feel that way, that they're fully deployed. But that brings up the question of how do you go about balancing out current positions with opportunities in other companies? We all know there's so many companies out there. And quite frankly, when we are trading amongst ourselves here, you do have to play that game of even though I'm in this position, is there another position? Is there another company that I like maybe more? Has the story changed? How do you go about balancing that? Yeah, no, very fair question. Look, and it, it's going to be different. The answer is going to be different for each investor. We all have, we all have different uh, different temperaments and, and, and different capital deployment styles. I guess I'd say for the MJG partnership, one of the easiest ways to to decide to liquidate a position is if you're expecting a catalyst and it either comes back negative or the company you know does not deliver and it's it's been delayed. So if we see changes to the timeline. Or, you know, this is a highly risky business. Sometimes, you know, management gets a shot on target and it just doesn't pan out. You know, that that's probably the easiest uh, and most obvious reason to sell a position, which can then free up cash for another opportunity. I generally won't liquid, liquidate a position entirely if I believe that it's undervalued. Management is doing what they said they would do and there's upcoming catalysts that, that could really create a change in value. Um, however, you know, there are opportunities to maybe trim uh, positions in terms of just waiting within the portfolio. If there's an insanely compelling opportunity that that I just can't miss within the MJG fund, I try not to allow any of our positions fall below a two percent weighting within the overall portfolio. My view is that if I don't have enough conviction for each of our positions to at least be two percent of the portfolio, then it's not the right time to invest in them, or it's maybe just not the right opportunity at all. And then there are a couple, you know, larger larger positions. And if we see, a, you know, a run in share price, you can use an opportunity to, to trim some of your outsized positions. But I think that really depends on how you classify an investment. So, you know, some of the investments I view as compounders, names that I expect to, you know, own for the rest of this decade or as long as the MJG fund is around. If they go on a, a good share price run, I'm less inclined to sell. Other names I view more as uh, cigar butts, as in, in Ben Graham's uh, parlance. Uh, names that are trading at a you know stark uh, discount to what I think their fair value is. But if they were to increase 50% in price in a short period, it'd be a lot easier to trim, uh, if not sell the position entirely, um, because fair value is unlikely to, to move all too much uh, unless there's some really unforeseen development. So again, it, it gets it gets pretty nuanced, um, but it but it really will depend on on those factors. And I guess another one I'll, I'll throw in there. I mean, we do try to balance jurisdictional risk with within the portfolio. So if, if we have a lot of exposure to a given jurisdiction between a couple investments, and there's a new investment that is just too good to pass up that is also focused on said jurisdiction, you know, I would look to the, the two other names that are exposed to that jurisdiction as places to potentially trim. Um, so that, that's another way to, way to think about it. So pretty nuanced, but it's it's an important question. Well, Matt, I know that in general, you like to look at company specific opportunities. You like to evaluate the management teams, the project and go through all the things before you even look at what commodity it's in. But if I could tie you down and hold a gun to your head here and say, hey, Matt, which particular commodity do you see maybe having the most attractive setup in the year to come? 
Uh, your ear is to the ground in the sector and you get your finger on the pulse. You talk to a lot of people. Which which area do you really think may surprise people in 2024? Okay, well, there is a metal I want to talk about, but I mean, di- directly to your to your question, you know, we're, 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 we're very well exposed to copper. It's, it's our largest metal by weighting. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable with with copper at the moment. I think we could see we could see upside partially only due to the to the supply picture. I mean, we, we've obviously seen a big disruption in global supply through the Cobra Panama fiasco. I know you've had plenty of guests discuss that, but that's going to have repercussions for years to come um, within within the copper complex. And then we've also seen a lot of the major miners come out and both disappoint on production in 2023 on the copper front as well guiding lower in terms of, of, of expectations over the next couple of years. So, you know, that, that's one that could surprise over the course of 2024. I mean, I would say the metal that's most contrarian at the moment, and I, I don't think it's going to be a lucrative investment over the next 12 months per se. These, these cycles can take time to, to play out. They do take time to play out. But nickel, boy, oh boy, has nickel become a contrarian opportunity. And I think it's an interesting hunting ground for, for new deals. You know, nickel was the worst performing base metal in 2023 by quite a margin, down over 40 percent over the course of the year and, and down over 70 percent since the, you know, the, the high profile nickel squeeze occurred in, in early 2022. This weakness has primarily been due to a, a flood of supply from Indonesia, which increased supply year over year in 2023 by a stunning 30 percent. So we're just seeing masses of nickel come online from from new projects in D- Indonesia. And then on the demand front, we've also seen really quick uptake of um, uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, battery chemistries for electric vehicles and other battery applications. Really is competition for the, the nickel manganese cobalt chemistries, which just a few years ago were, were, were the dominant chemistry. They, they still are, but the pendulum continues to swing towards lithium iron phosphate. So kind of headwinds on the supply and the demand front. And, and I just can't understate how ugly it's been out there just in the past 60 days, and I'll, I'll try to hammer through these quickly. We've had close to <laughs> close to a dozen different developments across the nickel sphere. I mean, we had the bankruptcy of panoramic resources and their Savannah mine in Western Australia. That was in December. Just in the past couple of weeks, we've had First Quantum idling the their Ravensthorpe operation um, in, in Western Australia. Past two weeks, we've had Wailu Metals announcing that their Cambalda uh, asset was going to be put on care and maintenance. And they, they literally bought this asset six months ago from Mincor Resources. So boy, is that a quick uh, about turn for, for Wailu Metals. BHP has had uh, talked in the past 10 days or so about uh, running their Nickel West operations at partial capacity um, and also considering a write down of their, their nickel unit as a whole. We have IGO uh, just yesterday. So I guess that was Wednesday, January 31st announcing that they were putting their Cosmos uh, project on on pause. And that was a project they just bought from Western Australia earlier this year. So that's another quick quick about turn in the nickel sphere. And then you have groups like Trafagora and Glencore uh, saying that they're going to stop funding entirely their nickel laterite operations in, in New Caledonia and, and try to find additional capital. Otherwise, those 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 operations won't, won't continue forward. So it really looks like extremely bleak. And, and this does pique my interest as a contrarian investor to look at nickel focused opportunities. That said, there's really no rush. These these things take time to play out. It could still be a uh, you know a lot more ugliness to come. But I, I do think the bottom is closer than not. This is the type of activity and the type of behavior you see when when a, a metal price uh, is bottoming. And yeah, again, there's no guarantees we'll make a move on an investment or two. But if you're looking at a metal that's as contrarian as it gets, I would throw nickel nickel into that category at the moment. And you know, with everything on sale, you may as well look at the very best high margin operations. Um, you know, probably on the sulfide front of things. So whether it's a name in production or more likely uh, for the MJG funds, you know, very very high quality nickel sulfide uh, development assets. You know, with everything on sale, no reason to compromise for, for anything but the best. All right, Matt, thank you very much for your time. I always find it so fascinating to hear what you're doing within the MJG partnership and your fund and what deals you are looking at, including the type of metals you're looking at. So, hey, we all very much value your time. I will post a link to the MJG Capital website within the weekend show posting, and I'm sure we'll chat with you next month. Matt, thanks for joining us on this weekend show, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the first hour of the weekend edition of the KE Report.
For our upcoming appearance schedule, visit kereport.com. The Corlin Economics Report will be back in just a moment. 